She was beautiful, shapely, and pale skin with thick, lustrous hair cascading halfway down her naked back. Her charms were offered openly, brightly, conveyed to him at the end of a gentle touch. So gentle. Little brushing fingers of energy tickled his chin, his jaw bone, his neck. Every muscle of his body tensed and he fought for control, battled the seductress with every bit of willpower remaining in him after so many years. He didn't even know why he resisted anymore. Didn't consciously remember what offerings of the other world, the real world, might be fueling his stubbornness. What were right and wrong in this place? What might be the price of pleasure? What more did he have to give? The gentle touch continued, soothing his trembling muscles, raising goose bumps across his skin wherever those fingers brushed, calling to him, bidding him to surrender. Surrender. He felt his willpower draining away, argued against his stubbornness. There was no reason to resist. He could have soft sheets and comfortable mattress. The smell, the awful reek so terrible that even years had not allowed him to get used to it be taken away. She could do that with her magic. She had promised him. Falling fast, he half closed his eyes and felt the touch continuing, felt it more keenly than before. He heard her snarl, a feeble, betchel sound. Now he looked past her. They were on the lip of a ridge, one of countless ridges across the broken, heaving ground that trembled as if it were a living thing, breathing, laughing at him, mocking him. They were up high. He knew that the ravine beyond the ridge was wide, and yet he could not see more than a couple of feet beyond the edge. The landscape was lost in the perpetual swirling grayness, the smoky pall, the abyss. Now it was his turn to growl, the sound that was not feral, not primal, but one of Rashine Bell of morality, of that tiny spark that remained in him of who he had been. He grabbed her hand and forced it away, turning it, twisting it. Her strength in resisting confirmed his memories, for it was supernatural, far beyond what her frame should have allowed. Still. He was the stronger and he forced the hand away, turned it about, then set his stare upon her. Her thick hair had shifted a bit, and one of her tiny white horns had poked through. Do not, my lover, she purred. The weight of her plea nearly broke him, like her physical strength. Her voice carried more than was natural. Her voice was a convict of charms, of deceit, of the ultimate light that was saw this place. A scream erupted from his lips and he heaved her backward with all his strength, hurled her from a ridge. 
Huge bat-like wings unfolded behind her and the succubus hovered, laughing at him. Her open mouth revealing forehead fangs that would have punctured his neck. She laughed and he knew that although he had resisted, he had not won, could never win. She had almost broken him this time came closer to it than the last, and would be closer still the next. And so she laughed at him, mocked him, always mocking him. He realized that it had been a test, always a test. He knew who had arranged it and was not surprised when the whip tore into his back playing him low. He tried to take cover, felt the intense heat building all around him, but knew that there was no escape. A second snapping had him crawling for the ledge. Then came the third lash, and he grabbed onto the lip of the ridge, screamed, and pulled himself over wanting to pitch into the ravine, to splatter his corporeal form against the rocks. Desperate to die. Erto, the great baler, twelve feet of smoking deep red scales and corded muscles, casually walked to the edge and peered over with eyes that had seen through the mists of the abyss since the dawn of time. Erdo sought out the falling form, then reached out to him. He was falling slower. Then he was not falling at all. He was writhing, caught in a telekinetic web, reeled in by the master. The whip was waiting and the next flash sent him spiraling, mercifully, into unconsciousness. Erto did not retract the whip's cords. The bailer used the same telekinetic energy to wrap them about the victim, binding him fast. Erto looked back to the hysterical succubus and nodded. She had done well this day. Drool slipped over her bottom lip at the sight of the unconscious form. She wanted to feast. In her eyes, the table was set and waiting. A flap of her wings brought her back to the ledge and she approached cautiously, seeking some way through the Baylor defenses. Erto let her get close, so close, then gave a slight tug on the whip. His victim flopped away queerly, jumping past the Baylor's perpetual flames Erto shifted a step to the side, putting his bulk between the victim and the succubus. I must, she whined, daring to move a bit closer, half walking and half flying. Her deceivingly delicate hands reached out and grasped at the smoky air. She trembled and panted. Erdo stepped aside. She inched closer. The bailer was teasing her. She knew, but she could not turn away. Not with the sight of this helpless one. She whined, knowing she was going to be punished. But she could not stop. Taking a slightly roundabout route. She walked past the bailer. She whined again, 
her feet digging a firm hold that she might rush to the prone victim and taste of him at least once before Erto denied her. Out shot Erto's arm, holding the sword that was wrought of lightning. He lifted it high and uttered a command and the ground bolted with the strength of a thunderstroke. The succubus waited and leaped away, running for the ledge and then flying off a bit, shrieking all the while. Erdo's lightning hit her in the back and sent her spinning, and she was far below the edge of the ridge before she regained control. Back on the ledge. Erto gave her not another thought. The bailer was thinking of his prisoner, always of his prisoner. He enjoyed tormenting the wretch, but had to continually sublimate his bestial urges. He could not destroy this one, could not break him too far else the victim would hold no value for the bailer. This was but one being, and measured against the promise of freedom to walk again on the prime material plane, that did not seem so much. Only Driss Dodorn, the renegade dark elf, the one who had banished Erto to a hundred years in the abyss, could grant the freedom. The drove would do that, Erto believed, in exchange for the rouch. Erto turned his horned, a plied head to look over one massive shoulder. The fires that surrounded the baler burned low now. Simmering as was Erdo's rage. Patience, the bailer reminded himself. The wretch was valuable and had to be preserved. The time was coming. Erdo knew. He would speak with Driss Doderton before another year had passed on the material plane. Erto had made contact with the witch, and she would deliver his message. Then the bailer, one of the true Tanari, among the greatest denizens of the lower plains, would be freed. Then Erto could destroy the wretch, could destroy Dresdodorden and could destroy every being that locked the renegade drove. Patience 